Excellent. I'm going to wait a couple of more minutes before I begin. Um, and I should excuse myself in advance. I, um, I have allergies today. And so my um, voice is not as clear as I would like it to be. And I, I've got sniffles, so I may have to um, turn away and blow my nose from time to time. But um, I am here and happy to be with you. Um, I, I have Courtney Mahaney here with me. And Courtney is the assistant director of the Dickens Project and my valuable assistant. <clears throat> and she will help, uh, she will help the, uh, with the uh, question. So if you, if you have a question, if you have something you would like to uh, raise as a topic, something you would like to ask me directly, um, please indicate that on the raise hand function in the, in the uh, bar below. And Courtney will keep track of the order in which people are raising their hands. Uh, that's in the reactions. Uh, uh, at the bottom of, of your screen. Uh, or you can put a question in the chat if you want to do that. So uh, uh, anyway, Courtney, thank you for, for helping to uh, run, for setting up the, the video and the Zoom and for helping me with, with the questions. So I think I'll, I'll go ahead and start. And as you know, we are reading Dombey and Son. And uh, last month when we, when we began, I, I said that I think that Dombey and Son is really the, the, the first of Dickens's truly great novels. It's, it's the, the first novel of his maturity. And the evidence for that claim, which is one that is pretty generally accepted by Dickens scholars, uh, has to do with two things. It has to do with the structure and organization of the novel, and it has to do with the quality of the prose. And uh, I must say, I, in, in rereading the novel in preparation for today, I am once again just blown away by uh, Dickens's artistry by his his skill in organizing the plot and by certain passages that that I just stop and linger over because they are so compelling so powerful just as as language so Dickens I think is at at this point in his career is at the height of his powers and will continue to be so for the next uh, decade um, but this is this is truly a remarkable achievement, and one of the the things that I, I mentioned before about the the structure and organization of the novel is that uh, Dickens is is in excellent control of the organization or the structure of the novel, and it falls neatly into four equal parts. And you, you remember, of course, that the novel is serialized um, in uh, 20 parts, the last part being actually a double number. So it's 19 monthly numbers. And uh, the first five chapters, the first five monthly numbers, excuse me, constitute one complete segment. The next five monthly numbers, which takes you to the midpoint of the novel, or another structural unit. And then similarly for the second half of the novel. So you can, you can see him in control of the organization in a way that he has not been in, in his previous novels. It's, it's also a novel that is not linear in its, in its organization. Um, all of the previous novels are linear in that they deal with a, a journey, uh, travel, uh, the experience of growing up, Little Nell's travels around England, Mr. Pickwick's uh, adventures as he travels, or Nicholas Nickleby with his 
his adventures. In, in Dombey and Son, one of the things that is to me very interesting is that the young man in search of a career and uh, a marriage partner who in this novel is Walter, uh, is really not the principal character in the novel. Uh, th there's a diminishment in the young protagonist, a, a diminishment of, uh, of his role and his importance in, in the plot. And so there is a, a story, a Walter story that we can follow, but I don't think um, Dickens is as interested in that story as he is in the other stories that are going on, particularly the story of the Dombey household. And Walter is an outsider to the Dombey household. So this is really a, a novel about Dombey and Son, um, both as a business and as a family. And, and Walter is, is out, an outsider. So we, we could read for the Walter plot, but we would think of all that we would miss if we were reading just for the Walter plot or expecting that to be the main thing. And uh, th there's another thing about that, which is the, the, the location. This is a novel that is organized in terms of locations. I mean, the Dombey household, the Dombey business, Miss Tox's residence in Princess's place. Um, there, there are many distinctive locations. Walter's location, the location that is associated with him primarily, is the wooden midshipman. And I think there's a, a little bit of a joke about that. I mean, the wooden midshipman is the, the sign, the, the, the business sign outside the shop, Uncle Saul's shop, that advertises that he um, is a, a merchant of uh, maritime equipment of all sorts. Uh, but I think Walter is a little bit of a wooden uh, protagonist. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's sort of a, a stiff figure. He's, he's, uh, he's, he is the protagonist, but he's not uh, the center of interest. And, and there's something just a little predictable about the Walter story. We, we guess from early on, I think, when we see him rescue Florence, um, from the um, accident that happens early in in the, the uh, in the novel, that Walter and Florence are headed towards some romantic relationship, um, but Walter disappears for uh, big parts of the novel. He's he's gone off to sea. He's the uh, uh, is on on board ship. So and we don't follow him. The narrative does not follow Walter. It stays in England, it stays in, in London. So Walter disappears. I mean, if he's the protagonist of the, of the novel, uh, you know, why, does he, why does he disappear? And why is he wooden in, in that sense? So I think there's a little bit of a joke that is uh, connected to his uh, association with the wooden midshipman. But I wanted to, to say uh, one other thing, which is about the title. Of, of the novel, Dombey and Son. And we talked a little bit about this last time. Um, and I, I'm interested in, uh, again, in, in structure in, in this novel. And I think the title, Dombey and Son, is crucial to understanding how this novel is, is working. And in the following way, it's, it's a novel that has to do with substitutions and surrogates and uh, vacancies and replacements. And if you think about Dombey and Son as the title of a business and as a, of a family business, uh, there was you, Mr. Dombey, the, the, the character whom we meet uh, in the first chapter, um, was once a son. And his father was Dombey, and, and Mr. Dombey, the current Mr. Dombey, was son. And now that father, the, the old man, he, he actually gets referred to at one point in relation to the story of the backstory of John Carker. Um, 
that man is that old man is no longer alive. The father is is, is absent, um, and we might wonder if if there's any lingering presence of Dombey's father uh, in in the novel, but he doesn't appear in person because he's he's dead. So Dombey um, is now. Mr. Dombey, the character, is now the Dombey of Dombey and Son, and Paul, the son who's born in the first chapter, is son. And this is very important for Mr. Dombey, of course, because it means that the family lineage will succeed, and eventually, he hopes, Paul will grow up, and Paul will become Dombey, and he will have a son, and Dombey and Son will continue as in, in perpetuity. I mean, um, that's the... The, the narrative, the self-narrative or the fantasy that Mr. Dombey lives with. But if you think about that, it's a structure of substitutions that when Dombey dies, that is the father of the current Mr. Dombey, then Mr. Dombey, the current Mr. Dombey moves into the empty slot of Dombey and his son, Paul, will move into the, uh, the son position and so on and so on. So it's a structure of succession and substitutions, vacancies, and then vacancies that get filled. But that's the structure of the entire novel. The entire novel is organized as a series of substitutions. And so we can follow this. There, there are just so many examples of that. I mean, the, the, you know, the most obvious one early in the novel is um, that Paul's mother dies. So there's a vacancy, there, there's, there's an opening, you could say. And um, who's gonna fill that vacancy? Well, Polly Toodle comes along. Polly is the mother substitute. But there also is Miss Tox and Mrs. Chick who are somewhere in the mix there as potential substitutes uh, uh, for that vacancy. And, um, then the death of Mrs. Dombey, of uh, Paul's mother, is also creates another vacancy, which is that there's a vacancy in the wife slot in the novel. So who will become, who will fill the empty slot of the uh, Mrs. Dombey? Um, so there's a, a, a courtship opening there. And so uh, one of the things that's happening early in the, in the novel is that Mrs. Chick is uh, positioning Ms. Tox to become the future uh, Mrs. Dombey. But of course that does not work out as we know from having read through to the middle of the novel, uh, chapter 31, uh, I, 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 it's, a, it's a spoiler of sorts, uh, but uh, Mr. Dombey marries someone other than Miss Tox. Uh, he marries uh, Edith Granger and uh, so, uh, chapter 31, the first half of the novel, concludes with a chapter uh, called The Marriage, the, the, the Wedding, rather. And uh, so, uh, but think about all the other vacancies that occur and people who disappear and then get replaced. Um, when Paul dies, uh, that creates a vacancy in the sun slot, the, the son position. Who will replace Paul as the son? And there are a number of candidates for that position, Walter being one of them. Uh, but uh, uh, James Carker is, is also a, a candidate uh, to become, uh, to fill the son slot. And, um, and then uh, Saul Gills, goes away, disappears, goes, goes in search of Walter. Uh, there's another vacancy there. Uh, Captain Cuddle moves into, Saul, moves into Saul's shop. So again, there's a vacancy and a substitution, a replacement. Walter disappears. Walter goes off on the sun and air. Um, Mr. Carker arranges for Rob the Grinder to move in. So again, it's just happening all over the place. And uh, you, you just, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go on and try and give other examples of, of this, this pattern, 
but the whole novel is is built around this notion of structure, vacancy, substitution, rivalry, competition for who who will fill uh, the place. And I think the 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 most important uh, vacancy is that sun slot in the the title Dombey and Son. So. Um, there, there's one other thing I wanted to, to comment on that I talked about last time just briefly, and it's in relation to Susan Nipper. And uh, someone read one of the um, uh, amusing passages that, that Susan Nipper uh, speaks where she, uh, she says something that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, and I want to, to come, come back to that and to propose a way of understanding how Susan Nipper talks. And she's a comic character. She's, she's someone that we, I think we enjoy her. And it's partly because she's contrary. She's black eyed Susan. And so she speaks her mind and uh, she's an independent, uh, um, sometimes uh, obstreperous uh, servant in, in, in the household. But, her, her language uh, is, I, I think there are two ways to understand it. One is in terms of contradiction, that uh, every, every sentence that she says, or almost every sentence, particularly these little nipperisms, that, as, as people call them, is built around a contradiction, where the first part of the sentence makes a claim, and then the second part contradicts it. And that is just an expression of Susan's character, that, that she's contrary. She's, uh, so I, this is not an example that she uses, but I, I like to, to think of, of Susan's speech as um, following the form, uh, the following form. Um, uh, you, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So that but is, is the turning point, that there's a, an introductory clause, and then there's a but, and then there's a contradictory clause that follows it. And often the first clause and the second clause don't have logical connection. You can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink has a certain logic to it. But Susan's statements don't always, aren't always logical. Um, and so the other way to think about them besides being contradictions is uh, to think of them as non sequiturs. That there's, uh, there's statement number one, and then there's a contradiction, uh, but the contradiction doesn't necessarily follow from the original premise. So, so think of, of Susan as someone who enjoys being contradictory and who speaks often in non sequiturs. And I think Dickens is enjoying these um, jokes that are jokes about the structure of a sentence. Um, the, Dick, it, again, just one of the things that is wonderful about Dombey and Son is to look at the language. I mean, to look at, the, and, and there's one place in, in, um, in the chapter that's called Paul's Education that uh, I'm not going to try to read it, but because it's it's a pretty long passage, but it's it's a joke that's entirely about language, and Mr. Blimber is the the teacher in um, uh, in Blimber's academy, and he's a classical scholar. He's a Latinist, and we know that Dickens studied a little bit of he knew a little bit of of Latin. He was not a classical scholar, though he. He had a knowledge of classical mythology, and he uses that in, occasionally in his, uh, as a reference in his novels. But at one point, while the boys are at dinner, Dr. Blimber begins a sentence. And the joke is that the syntax of that sentence is so complicated that the sentence goes on for about four pages. And the joke is that the boys can't stand this because learning Latin and learning the syntax of Latin, the sentence structure of Latin is a form of torture to them. And 
Dr. Blimber's sentence keeps getting interrupted by the boys, um, by one boy in particular who coughs at every opportunity. And his cough, of course, is that he's gagging <laughs> at the thought of having to swallow a Latin sentence. Um, my, I remember my, my, fa my father was, uh, was a student in a school where uh, Latin was required. And he said that it took him uh, two years of studying Latin before he learned that Latin was actually a language that was spoken by living people. He thought it was a, a, a torture that was invented for young boys. So I think he would have resonated very, uh, very closely with uh, the experience of the boys listening to Dr. Blimber's sentence. But it's a joke. The, my, my point is that, that Dickens is playing with language and with one particular uh, aspect of language, which is, is syntax. So it's, it's really worth stopping and spending time just reading Dickens's sentences. I think in, in Dombey and Son, he's, he's at the peak of his game. And um, just one other example I, I'll, I'll mention is Mr. Dombey. And uh, when Mr. Dombey speaks, when, when he proposes a toast, uh, when he speaks at uh, Paul's christening, um, the baptism seen early in the, in the novel. Mr., uh, when, when, uh, when Dombey uh, speaks to Edith Granger after he has met her in, uh, uh, in, in the, the novel, in, in, in the chapters that follow uh, the death of little Paul. Uh, notice how Mr. Dombey speaks. His syntax is very stiff. Um, and compare him with the syntax and the language, the, the diction, the, the word choice, uh, with the language, uh, the syntax and the diction of um, two other male characters who are very close to him. One is, is Carker um, and the other is uh, Major Bagstock. And they are both very talkative and um, chatty. And uh, uh, the, the, in the case of Bagstock, there's an excess of language. And his language is full of um, uh, military jargon and references to the devil. And of course, Bagstock is a kind of devilish figure himself. But um, uh, Carker is much more suave and subtle. He, he, he knows how to speak. His, his language is very much under control. Uh, Mr. Dombey, uh, when, when he meets Edith Granger and finds her to be attractive, uh, tries <laughs> to flirt, <laughs> but Mr. Dombey is incapable of flirting. He does not know how to make small talk. Um, and he relies on Bagstock and then later on on Carker to speak for him. So Mr. Dombey has no ability in language. And his language, if you look at his, if you read the sentences that, that Mr. Dombey speaks, his syntax is, is very formal, very stilted, uh, which is of course the way that Mr. Dombey himself is. He's, he's very stiff, he's very rigid. And that rigidity is a, uh, is a sign of his um, social awkwardness, we, we could say. Uh, Mr. Dombey has, has little access to the social graces. He's a businessman. Um, you know, his world is, is business. But Carker uh, is, is someone, as we come to know, who, although he is from the business world, he also uh, is uh, uh, an artist. He knows how to play games. Gombe Dombey knows, does not know how to play any game. 
um, play is something that is foreign to him. But Carker knows card games and um, board games, and he knows people games as well. And Mr. Dombey doesn't know people games. He doesn't know how to move in the social world with fluency and ease and, and comfort. So um, anyway, just enjoy the language of, of, of the entire novel and think not just about the content of what people say, but think about how they say it. So I'm gonna um, just summarize uh, where the plot has gone through the first half of the novel and um, then turn things open to, to you. I have, have some questions that I wanna ask you, but um, let's just remember where the, the story has gone. So um, the first five monthly numbers are devoted largely to what's happening with little Paul. Um, Paul's birth, uh, the death of his mother, uh, the Polly Tootle episode who comes in and replaces the mother, uh, the episode where uh, uh, Florence gets separated from the other people she's with, Walter saves her, uh, Paul comes back home, Walter, uh, Walter is not exactly um, rewarded for having saved Florence. Um, uh, and that's an interesting aspect of, of, of what happens. But Paul does not flourish. Paul is a, is a strange child and we should talk more about the strangeness of, of Paul. And Paul gets sent to uh, uh, be with Mrs. Pipchin and then Mrs. Pipchin passes him along to Dr. Blimber and at Dr. Blimber's school. And then Paul continues not to, to flourish. And um, there's a wonderful scene uh, that is uh, Paul gets ready to, I'm gonna uh, read the, uh, the chapter title. Um, uh, Paul grows more and more old fashioned and goes home for the holidays. And I think that that monthly number, the one in, that begins with the preparation for the long holidays, uh, that monthly number is one of the most exquisite in, uh, in the novel. And the goodbye party, uh, the, the, the party before the long vacation is, is one of the most touching, most poignant uh, chapters in the novel because we, we realize at the time, I think, and uh, particularly in retrospect that although everyone else is looking forward to the long vacation because they have plans and we see the, even the, the Blimbers and uh, Mr. Feeler, Feeder rather, uh, the, t the teacher uh, anticipating the holidays ahead that for Paul to say goodbye to people is really that he's not coming back. For him to go home means two things. It means that he's going home to London to his father's house, but he's also going home to where he came from what the waves were saying. And so to go home is, and to say goodbye, uh, and everyone comes to, to say goodbye to Paul because somewhere they know, and we as readers know, that Paul is going to die. And so the, the death of, of Paul, uh, a quarter, one quarter of the way through the novel is, uh, is a terribly moving and, and in some ways unexpected. It's both expected and unexpected because when we began the novel, we, we thought, oh, Dombey and Son, it's gonna be about Paul. It's gonna be about how Paul grows up to be the son who fills the sun slot. But no, 
Paul is gone. And, and readers found this, um, uh, you know, they, they like contemporary readers like readers ever since have fallen in love with Paul. We, we love Paul, everyone loves Paul and we don't want to lose him, but we lose him. And it's, it's deeply, deeply sad. Um, so what's the novel gonna do now? I mean, if Paul was a, a candidate for the principal character, the novel has to start over again. It's, it's as if the novel really begins a second time with uh, after the death of, of Paul. And um, there are a couple of things that, that happen when, um, so I'm, I'm again, just sort of summarizing uh, the, the way that the, the novel moves. So Paul, Paul, Paul is gone. Um, and there's a period of mourning and Florence moves closer to the center of the novel. Uh, Dombey and son becomes Dombey and daughter. And we see Florence alone in the house. Um, and the chapters that, that describe uh, Florence in the Dombey household. Miss, Mr. Dombey has gone off to Leamington Spa with Major Bagstock. Um, and Florence, there, there's a fairy tale quality to, to that part of the novel. She's Sleeping Beauty. Um, she's, she's a kind of ghost in an empty house. She's also a Sleeping Beauty waiting for a Prince Charming to come and um, and kiss her and bring her alive. She's also a young woman who's growing up. And I think that the, um, we, can, we can think about that period when Florence is alone in the house as a kind of latency period in which Florence is moving toward becoming a young woman, becoming an adolescent. So Florence is asleep but she's not entirely asleep. Um, she's growing up and becoming a woman or about to become a woman. And as such, she's eligible to be courted and perhaps married. And so who will marry her? Who that, you know, Another way to fill the son slot in the novel would be to marry the daughter. So who are the potential suitors for Florence? And um, Walter, of course, is one of them. Uh, Carker is another one. Um, and then there's Toots, there's Mr. Toots, uh, uh, one of the most wonderful minor characters in, in all of Dickens and one of my particular favorites. So, so you have a comic lover, you have a, um, uh, uh, an appropriate lover, Walter, who's, and you have um, the sinister uh, lover in, in Carker. So um, part of what happens in the, in the, the second uh, quarter of the novel is that the focus shifts from Paul to Florence. And then another thing that happens is that we have a grown-up courtship plot. And the grown-up courtship plot is Mr. Dombey being escorted by Major Bagstock to Leamington Spa and getting introduced to um, uh, a particularly beautiful and eligible uh, young woman, Edith Granger and her mother. And uh, so Dombey is gone. There, there, there's, there's even, uh, I, I think it's monthly number seven, Dombey is absent entirely for uh, the three chapters that make up that, that monthly number. And that's when we watch what happens with other characters and we're aware of, of Florence. And it's Dombey is out there awkwardly trying to uh, make small talk with, 
with uh, Edith and um, being helped along by uh, Major Bagstock. So, so the second section of the novel is, I think, divided largely between two plots. One is the courtship plot of Mr. Dombey, um, and the other is uh, uh, the sort of latency uh, plot of Florence. And Florence misses her father. One of the things that is wonderful, I think, about uh, that section of the novel is that Florence misses her father she goes at night, She's, I, I talked about her as a kind of ghost. She goes at night to the door of his rooms and kisses the door because she misses her father so much. And so uh, the plot is about the possibility of Florence winning her way into the heart of Mr. Dombey. Um, is, will it be possible uh, for Florence to win her father's love. And Dickens is sometimes described as a, uh, a novelist who does not have psychological depth, that his characters are flat characters rather than round characters in that terminology that is uh, sometimes used to describe his, his novels. And um, I think this is a novel that, that shows how inadequate that kind of terminology is for Dickens. I think this is a, a novel in which there is great psychological depth and insight, both into Florence and her longing for her father's love, and also uh, into the relationships between Dombey and uh, Edith, Dombey and Parker, Dombey and Major Bagstock as well. So the culmination of this uh, particular uh, sequence in the novel up to chapter 31, the, when, when uh, Dombey and Edith get married, is devoted to courtship plots. And the novel has begun a, a, again. It's one of the things that is impressive about this is that uh, a character who is going to be one of the main characters in the entire novel, Edith, has not been introduced until the novel is well underway. And so we meet Edith and she will become increasingly important as the, as the novel progresses. So um, that's, that's a kind of summary of where we are in terms of, of the plot. Um, I, I, I'm interested in what parts of the novel uh, up to chapter 31 are of particular interest to you that you would like to talk about. And um, I, I want to open the floor for, for questions and ask you where you would like to begin. So put your hands up in the, in the chat. And Courtney, would you please keep track of who is uh, uh, raising their hands and call on them, and we will we will talk. I don't see how to get my hand up in the chat, but I have something I want to say. Okay, okay, we'll start with Peggy. So I would say this is a more of a novel about Florence than anybody else. If you want a protagonist, it's about her development. From she loses her mother, she's completely. Um, rejected by everybody she keeps loving her father she's there with her brother that i know that all that is about her brother in school but she's the one that gets him whatever accomplishments he has in school um she's become his mother uh she has all these adventures she's it she just connects all these things together and she has this character development that's going on that we're not getting about anybody else, really. Um, and Dombey might as well be a robot. <laughs> <laughs> he, he doesn't show up that much anyway. Um, I, I think if you look at the sentences he's in, there are very few. And he's unreal. He's very unreal. How can anybody be that clueless and be running a company 
it's working. Of course, the company isn't working, but um, so I'm, I'm really there for Florence with all the stuff that's happening with her and how she's dealing with it and stuff that happens next, which we're trying to not talk about yet. Yeah, yeah. We, but, we have to follow the rule. We're not going to talk about anything right, but beyond it's chapter 31. The Florence, yeah. the whole, is the connector yeah. through the whole thing with much more of a, a growth and development than anybody else I can see there. Yeah, I, I think that's, those are very good observations. And Florence uh, is more in the background at, at the beginning of the novel but she comes out more and more. And so her growth and development, she's there to help Paul with his education. I mean, there's a, um, there's, there's a point about female education that you know girls don't deserve to get educated, but Florence educates herself along she's with- She's there in the beginning. Yeah. She's laying over her dying mother and she's there in the beginning. Yep. So. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Barbara. So unmute Bar yourself if you have to unmute. I had to read this book on tape and I have finished the whole thing. So I'm not really sure where chapter 31. So you can tell me and I will stop. Okay, don't go beyond the marriage to uh, the wedding to Edith. Okay. Well, you can tell me if this is before or after. I, the woman that, that, that kidnaps her and takes her dress and all that, she later on becomes a character in the novel. Yes. And she has this mysterious daughter who looks a lot like the wife, the new wife. Yes, Am I we, gone? Have I gone way too far? Or no, you, you in, in the first scene where her, the that mysterious woman is called Good Mrs. Brown. That's the the name. That right, Good Mrs. Brown. And she's but the she, woman who steals uh, Florence's clothes and says that she, you know, threatens to cut her hair. And it's it's a it's a spooky moment in the early part. And then we don't know very much about her, but she mentions that she has a daughter. And then uh, she reappears in the section that is assigned before chapter 31 as someone who runs into Edith and Carker in the woods. She's out in the woods and she's a sort of gypsy fortune teller. And she says some mysterious things to them and she seems to know who they are and seems to know things about Mr. Dombey, but it's all very mysterious. So we don't ne yet know about her daughter other than that one mention in the first part of the book. All right, that's the part. I never did figure out why she knew so much about them um, and actually what she was even doing in the novel. Well, she could have been left out as far as I'm concerned and it wouldn't have changed anything. She will get more important in the second half of the novel because she does. A, yeah, there's a backstory. And but, I, I just one other thing I would say about her is that she's a witch. I mean, she's a, she's a character out of Macbeth or mm -hmm. uh, out of out of fairy tales, out of gothic fiction. She, she, there, there's a way in which this novel has trap doors in it where the realistic story, the story about 19th century England and business and <clears throat> marriage plots um, has trap doors where you sort of fall out of the realistic world into fairy tale or gothic or something really uncanny and strange. And Paul is a is a character who, who works on that edge. Um, Paul is a real little boy, but he's not a real little boy. He's he's a goblin. Uh, he, he's you know, what's he doing? I, you know, he he asks these strange questions. He's drawn to elderly people. He he hears things in the waves. He seems to be in touch with his mother. 
He seems to be a, sort of a Wordsworth romantic child who came trailing clouds of glory uh, uh, from the other world. Uh, so, so, you know, Dickens is, is writing a realistic novel and he's also writing something spooky, uh, something very um, imaginative. And, and good Mrs. Brown is a character who seems more on the spooky side. <laughs> And her daughter. His imagination. Yeah. Yes, I will save the rest of my, my questions about her daughter then for the next yeah. time. Good idea. Thank you. So um, Robert Gale has a question in the chat and he, he had emailed me for, uh, prior uh, to this meeting and I just want to read the, the question aloud. Um, in chapter 14, they use the word old-fashioned quite a lot. Did that expression mean something different in Victorian England? It seems to me that they used it as something as a mild insult. Today, I would hardly ever hear that term uh, used to describe a child. It's usually used to describe an elderly person set in their ways. <laughs> yeah, good, good question. Um, and uh, Dickens is using that term in a number of ways. I mean, one way in which old fashioned is operating in the novel is in the um, continuum between modernity and ancient times. And so things that are old fashioned are behind the times. The railroad is the epitome of what is modern in this novel. And one of the questions that I asked last time was uh, about which characters are modern and which are old fashioned. And Saul Gills is old fashioned. Saul Gills is behind the times because he's selling uh, maritime navigation equipment that is quickly going to be outmoded because steamships are soon to take over and the railroad is, is operating. So Saul and Captain Cuddle belong to uh, an earlier period in uh, maritime history. They're old fashioned in, in that sense. Paul is old fashioned in a different way. Uh, Paul is old fashioned um, in his manners. He's for a, a small boy, he's particularly courteous. He's, he, he, he seems to have gentlemanly uh, manners. Um, and that associates him with a, an old fashioned a fashion that is one of courtesy and politeness. But the term old fashioned eventually comes to mean the old, old fashion, which is the fashion of death. So Paul is touched by death, by intimations of um, both immortality and mortality from early in the novel. And um, I saw there was also a question in the chat about why, why does Paul die? What's the illness that Paul dies of? And um, I think you could say, if you want to read it realistically, that he dies of failure to thrive. That that, that's a term, a medical term that has certain specific meaning. Uh, today. There are also medical conditions, um, and I don't know the name uh, of them, where certain children age rapidly and, uh, and become prematurely old. And, and I think Paul fits into that category, that medical category as well. But Paul's, the old fashion that Paul has belongs, I think, more to the uh, spooky, supernatural, uh, the, the world that he comes from that is beyond this, this human world that we exist in, that Paul belongs to something more ancient, more, more primitive, more archaic, that's not human history, but that's a spiritual dimension. And that spiritual dimension is eternity, and that spiritual dimension is also death. So Paul's old fashioned is what pulls him back toward that 
other other world. At least that's that's the way that I understand it. Glenna? Yeah, <clears throat> I so appreciated what you said about the quality of the prose, John. That's a, I wanted to say that um, this time when I was rereading the novel, it just hit me. It is so beautifully written. I mean, some passages, well, particularly those having to do with Paul, are just absolutely exquisite. And, um, and, and so far as Paul being old fashioned, I think of it as um, he's not located in time somehow. I mean, people don't know how to say, I mean, because he's on that border between uncanny and real, realistic, but um, you know, you can't look at a child and say that child is about to die, but you know, it's getting at that not located in time somehow. Yeah. Um, and then I also wanted to say, I love that you brought up that passage with Dr. Blimber because I think the passages, I mean, I was laughing out loud when I read some of the stuff in Dr. Blimber's setting. And when Mrs. Blimber keeps saying, oh, if only I'd known Cicero. <laughs> well, only I'd known Cicero. Yeah. I mean, I just thought it was hilarious. Well, and, that, yeah, go ahead. I mean, this is probably the fifth time I've read Dombey, if maybe more. I've lost count. But um, I get more out of it every time. This is a novel that has so repaid. And I don't think I got the proto-feminism of it the first time around. I mean, I was probably a teenager. I probably read it before, you know, before modern feminism. And so, and then there was a point at which I read it and was like, oh, we're, you know, we're getting a, a lesson on how neglected this little girl is and how terrible that is. It's a and, novel about patriarchy. Yeah. And it's a novel about women's role in patriarchy, how women survive or forced to survive and resist. And um, anyway, more, more about that in the, <laughs> in the chapter. Right. To, but well, all I'm saying is each time I've reread it, something else has just grabbed me. And this, this, novel time, gets, this novel gets better and better the more often you read it. <laughs> that's exactly but it. I, I'm, I'm glad, I'll comment on one thing that you said, Glenna, because I, I haven't mentioned it so far and it's very important in the, uh, the novel and it's time. Um, Paul is fascinated with clocks, uh, the man who comes to fix the clock. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Blimber says to him, how are you, my little friend? How are you, my little friend? And uh, his, his speech uh, for Paul is the ticking of the clock. It's those minutes that are passing. But Paul exists both inside of time and subject to time, uh, illness and mortality. And Paul exists outside of time. I mean, that's part of the old fashion, this combination of immortality and mortality that, uh, is both temporal and atemporal at the, at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis? Hello. Hi. Um, hi. Um, well, I, I've now read it three times, thanks to you. I've never read a book more than once, I don't think, in my life for a long time. <laughs> um, a couple of thoughts and a question. Um, uh, on the on the blimbers and the, the language jokes, um, I love the description of Miss Blimber only being happy with the dead, dead, you know, languages that she can burrow into and get lost in. And it reminds me of a joke that my father, uh, who was schooled in Greek and Latin, made once after a man at a club of theirs made a speech in Latin. And my father went up to him and he said, well, that was a very interesting uh, speech. Um, too bad about your Etruscan accent. <laughs> um, but I just had to get that in there. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Also, the the separation, I, the filling the vacancies. Uh, I thought one of the most powerful scenes in the novel was when Dombey confronts Tootles, um, uh, the grinder's father, and and the grinder's father expresses, yeah, expresses his. Uh, 
uh, you know, condolences. And Dombey just seized with anger. And then he notices that the guy has, uh, he said, and he said, oh, we lost a baby once, you know, recently. But then Dombey realizes the crepe in his hat is, is for Paul, not for his own son. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought that the yeah, whole set, I hadn't even thought about the vacancies and stuff. So here's my question. What is it with Carker's teeth? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I still have a problem, like even visualizing it. And, um, and I know I looked up Carker in the OED and he is a Carker, um, but still the teeth is just such a, and he uses it all the time uh, in, in these scenes. I mean, as humor and as sinisterness and as obsequious and oily. So tell me about the teeth. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot to say about the teeth. I'll, I'll, I'll um, I mean, it's a novel about dogs and cats, um, you know, Diogenes, and you need to know who Diogenes <laughs> right. uh, was. It helps anyway. Um, a Diogenes, by the way, is also a very key plot point. What's a key plot point? Uh, Diogenes being Diog introduced. Yeah. It, um, one of those very important plot points. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, as is uh, Cuddles deciding to stay at the wooden midshipman yes, and yes, leave yeah. the Mech Stingers. Yeah. Anyway, um, didn't we? Yeah. Lo lots, lots and cats. Of, lots of things to, yeah. So, so Carker is feline. He's associated with cats. Um, and um, I, I, you know, people usually divide into people who love dogs and people who love cats. Some people love both. Um, in this novel, dogs uh, and Diogenes in particular is positively valued and cats, particularly Carker, <laughs> is negatively valued. So, so his teeth and his association with cats are something that uh, puts him on that side of the value uh, scale. Um, he's also associated with sharks, which is another, uh, and with, with serpents. And he's, you know, there are a lot of animal images, images that are associated with, with Carker, but teeth is the primary thing. And teeth in the human world are usually associated with smiles, that people, when they smile, show their teeth. Um, but Carker's smile is one that um, is, it, although it may ingratiate him to some people, uh, makes the narrator and makes the reader suspicious that Carker's smile has something very sinister and aggressive about it. There's one other thing that, um, this, this is an idea that I have about Carker's teeth. I mean, it's, his teeth are almost a prosthesis. They, 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 they exist independent of the person. They, they are, um, you know, to say they're false teeth isn't quite right because that would imply that he lost his teeth and, you know, had to have them replaced, but they have an independent existence. Um, the teeth are communicating uh, beyond the person who, uh, who, to whom the teeth belong. And there's well, like in the cartoons with the little choppers that yeah, go in the dark, yeah. but, yeah. but not in a funny way. I mean, in a, no, in, no. in a sinister and threatening way, um, a menacing way. Um, but there's one other aspect of the teeth that is an idea that, that I have. Um, uh, and it's the very strange scene between Carker and Rob the Grinder. You know, do you remember the, the sort of subplot of Rob the Grinder? Rob the Grinder is a Toodle son. And Dombey, uh, in an act intended to be uh, compensation and generosity to the Toodle family, decides that he will arrange for Rob the Grinder to get an education and send him to the charitable grinders school, a kind of charity school. And when you go to that school, you wear a uniform and Rob gets picked on in the streets because he wears the uniform of the charitable grinders. And so Rob goes bad. He, he turns bad, he cuts school. Um, he's a delinquent. Uh, he, unlike the other Toodles who seem to be um, 
happy and positive. Rob, Rob is a misfit. And um, so Carker, uh, th then Rob comes hanging around uh, Dombey and Son, looking for work or looking for a handout or looking for a favor. And Carker spots him. And Carker intuitively, Carker's a very subtle reader of other people. And he recognizes that this delinquent strain in Rob the Grinder. And he sees that he can make use of Rob the Grinder. And uh, he's going to make use of him by putting him as a spy in Saul Gills's shop. Uh, why does he do that? Because he wants information about Florence, because he's keeping an eye, Carker is keeping, keeping an eye on, on Florence. So he wants a spy there. This is another vacancy that gets filled. Walter has gone. Rob the Grinder gets substituted in for Carker. But Carker has some strange power over Rob the Grinder. It, it's, it, it's as if he has a... Well, you know, there were lots of theories in the, in the 19th century about animal magnetism and the power of personality and charisma. Carker has, has such a magnetism. It may be part of his animal nature. Um, it's part of his power anyway. And I think the teeth are part of that. So here's my theory. Here's, tell, tell me if this makes sense to you. I think that uh, Carker hypnotizes Rob the Grinder. You, know, you, could, you could understand this in terms of mesmerism and, and Dickens was very interested in mesmerism. You know, one of the ways that you hypnotize the sort of the stereotype is you take a shiny object, a watch, and, you know, you swing it back and forth and then the person goes into a trance state and then you have power over them. I think Parker, Carker's teeth are like that shiny object that exercises mm -hmm. a power over people and that Rob the Grinder uh, becomes a kind of zombie uh, uh, and that Carker has power over him and uh, Rob the Grinder will do his bidding. So that's another dimension to Carker's teeth that they are, they are, mm -hmm. they are a, a manifestation of his supernatural power. Supernatural is too strong a word, mm -hmm. but of a, of, a, of a power that is uh, beyond the normal power of human personality. <laughs> mm -hmm. That helps. That helps. Yes, thanks. Uh, so, uh, Gary. Uh, yes. Um, briefly, this will try to be brief. This is the first I've read this novel, and I read a lot of Dickens. And I read up through page chapter 31, and I am just in awe of this one. I mean, this is another masterpiece, but I guess um, tied into what was said previously about um, Mr. Tootles and Dombey himself, Dombey having lost his son and Tootles having more than one son. <laughs> you know, it's a very poignant scene that happens there. And in connection with that, um, I was just wondering about the sequence of this novel in relation to David Copperfield, because it precedes it. And I'm thinking, you know, I haven't read the rest of the novel. I've just read and stopped at chapter 31, but I was thinking how much David Copperfield has been said to be a novel of mourning. And I'm thinking, wow, that certainly pops up in this one that precedes it, certainly through Paul, who is a very goblin-like haunting character who dies. The scene with Mrs. Pipchin is just amazing. You know, them by the fireplace and so forth. And that other worldly aspect of it. But I guess I just wondered about that. In addition, finally, just the role of houses in Dickens. The houses take on a personality and just the vacancy that you talked about earlier, John, and, and the relationship between vacancies and replacements. And we're seeing that happen right here in this novel as well. Certainly when Florence comes home with um, the Nip Miss Susan Nipper and the house is in reconstruction. So that's it. Any comments you have on, on what I just said? Oh boy, those are, those are all really good 
observations. Um, yes, this this is deeply a novel of of mourning. I'm I'm not going to talk about its relationship to David Copperfield because that's that that gets us off on a on a. I on know. I, I'm but, sorry. But yes. I couldn't help it because of that's, course, I, of I, course. I, 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 I about it. But but one of the things I mean, uh, this is this is a, Florence is in mourning. Um, in deep mourning, she misses Paul. Her connection to Paul was a spiritual connection. It, she was more deeply attuned to him than, than anyone uh, as a sibling. And um, when one of the most touching things for me, a detail I had not remembered from previous readings is that at the, um, at the wedding in chapter 31, when, when uh, Mr. Dombey and Edith Mary. Uh, uh, Florence is given a fancy new dress to wear to the, um, and then after the wedding, she comes home and she puts on the mourning dress right. yes. that she wore. She, because that's really what's important for her. And Paul, although Paul has died, you know, in chapter, whatever it is, chapter 15, um, Paul's presence remains powerful throughout the novel. And not, not as a ghost. I mean, he doesn't come back as a spirit, but people remember him. And there are moments where Mr. Dombey remembers that Paul was more attached to Florence than to him. And, and Mr. the pain that Mr. Dombey has that is his inability to get access to his emotion and properly to mourn. His, his emotions are so alien to him that he doesn't know what to do with them. That's part of his social awkwardness and, and incompetence as a, as a human being. And I think the novel actually makes us, it, it, I mean, it, it creates a, a kind of sympathy for Mr. Dombey because mm -hmm. Mr. Yes. Dombey is yes. unable to, to mourn. And, right. and, and that very inability, everything that blocks him from the world of feeling, from the, the world of emotion, is what blocks him from Florence. And he turns that blockage into anger. And he's- I angry. love that scene on the train, when he's on the train yes. and the progress of the train. It's just that, that whole segment. Oh. Oh. of him just kind of moving fast on the, I, I, I don't remember what chapter it's in, but it's very powerfully powerful. Well, and the that, writing is exquisite. Yeah. Away with a roar and a, and a rattle. I mean, it's, it's, it's poetry uh, there. Yes. A different kind. But um, th th just to come back to one other point that you made, Gary, uh, the scene where he sees uh, Mr. Tootle at the yes. train station with the crepe in, in his hat. Um, he's resentful of Mr. Tootle for mourning Paul because that stakes a claim right. to Paul. He wants to be the only one who owns Paul. Right, right. Um, and he doesn't want to share Paul with anyone else. And that's why he hates Florence because he can tell that, that Paul was more attached to Florence. And He's going to repeat that with, you know, he hates Florence because Edith is more attached to Florence. Uh, uh, Florence is more attached to Edith, and uh, so Mr. It's one of the reasons why Mr. Dombey is happy to have Miss Tox be a godparent, because Miss Tox is such an inferior person in his world of importance that she cannot do for Paul what a godparent is supposed to do. That is to be generous and to leave some money. And, you know, she's so poor that she can't do anything. So she's not a threat to any kind of ownership to Paul. Uh, Mr. Dombey wants to hoard Paul entirely for himself. And he doesn't realize that that's not good for a little boy uh, to, to be possessed in, 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 in that way. Um, so many things you said, Gary. That are, that are... Yeah, it's just, and, and then just, you know, finally the houses, I just, I think of other Dickens novels and houses 
I couldn't help it as soon as we got to the them returning. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the, the house is a major character in. in yeah. That. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so much. Courtney. Okay. Uh, Kirker's teeth. I wonder if Dickens had in mind a man may smile and smile and be a villain. I was in Hamlet, I think. Um, uh, quite, quite certainly, quite certainly. Um, you know, he's he's steeped in Shakespeare, and um, uh, but he, you know, Carker is 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 more than just a literary allusion. Carker Carker is a wonderful creation. I mean, among Dickens's villains, Carker is is one of the most subtle and crafty. And we we should we should really talk about Carker. What is what is Carker's game? What is what is uh, you know he's he's a he's good at game. I want, so I want to say something more uh, which Carker fits into. Okay. Uh, always with, well, I appreciated what Glenna said because I too am finding more and more as I reread. Any Dickens novel, for me, you have to refer to the 19th century theater and the way he sees his characters like Carker is often very much the way it would be played on stage. Uh, the construction of the book interests me. Dickens set himself two tough problems. The first one being that you think it's going to be about Paul and it kills him off a quarter of the way through the book. Yep. There's a good letter to Forster, in which he talks about having to shift the focus to Florence all at once. The other thing in the construction that uh, seems to me interesting is the extent to which it is made up with lots of absences. People disappear for a whole installment or more. And this again is rather like on stage you'd be very conscious if you were watching it on stage, when is Walter going to come back? Uh, if I can peek ahead one moment, Dombey's honeymoon, we hear nothing, we see nothing. There are just a lot of disappearances and then reappearances. Oh. A reference for Dombey and his pride. I kept thinking of the Duke in My Last Duchess. He doesn't like something, but he's too proud. He doesn't, he says, to say something would be to stoop. And Dombey tries to get someone else to do his dirty work for him. Uh, yeah, that's enough vaguely related things, I'll stop. Okay. As, as always, good, good observations. Um, Carker is in some ways a stage villain. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's no mustache, but the, the teeth substitute for the, the twirling mustache that uh, melodrama would, would use. Um, and, um, but I, 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 I would like to pursue the, Carker theme and ask people what what they think Carker is up to. What what is Carker's relationship with Dombey like? What is Carker's relationship with Edith like? Uh, as, particularly in the second quarter of the novel. So if people have thoughts about that, I, I would really like to hear them. And then one other thing about Carker, I asked. Uh, well, there's the question that was asked about old fashioned. And I said, one way to think of old fashioned is in relation to modernity, what is old and what is modern. And um, 
you know, is Mr. Dombey a modern man? Um, and how do we think about Carker in relation to that question as well? But let's take the next question, uh, Courtney. Marta? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm afraid I wasn't going to speak on Carker. Uh, <laughs> okay, we'll talk uh, about just, any, anything you want. Just in terms of Paul and Mr. Dombey, uh, I think uh, any sympathy we have for, for Mr. Dombey is, is that you can imagine what his upbringing was like in order to turn him into this soulless, emotionless business person. And in a way, we're sort of glad that Paul doesn't have to go through that because that's exactly what would happen to him in, in having that sort of an upbringing. Um, and the, the thing I thought was, was interesting about it, uh, the portrayal of Paul is that we do see him as this odd child until his last chapter, chapter 14, where suddenly we see things from his point of view, which we haven't before. And we see what a sweet boy he is and what a caring boy he is. And that's, I think, is sort of like the thing that really flips us into our grief at his passing. Um, that's a very important point. I'm, I'm glad you, you, you brought it up. One of, one of the, well, there, there, there are two things that Dickens does in this novel that he had not done as systematically in any previous novel. One is his use of the present tense. And uh, the wedding chapter, chapter 31, that we've used as our stopping point, is the entire chapter is in the present tense. And that's a kind of experiment in writing. Dickens had used the present tense for narration in, in other novels, but not as systematically as he does in Dombey and Son. And to write an entire chapter in the present tense is a kind of stylistic tour de force. But the other thing, and it's what you call our attention to, is the use of the child's point of view. And in that chapter, uh, chapter 14, the one in, in which Paul dies, and it's also uh, in chapter 12, Paul's introduction to a new, uh, no, it's uh, in Paul goes more and more old fashioned. Um, the, the narration is focalized, it's through Paul's consciousness and uh, time begins to shift and blur because Paul is, is ill, he's, he's feverish, he's, he's no longer tracking the passage of time in the way that you do when you're healthy. And so we can explain it naturalistically in, in that sense. But Paul is also moving outside of clock time. It's one reason he's fascinated with clocks is that he, he's interested in time and he exists, as I was trying to suggest before, in a kind of double temporality. And then Paul looks at the wallpaper. And again, I think we can explain it naturalistically that, that he's a little bit delirious and feverish and um, having hallucinations but he also sees things and people and animals in the wallpaper. And he has second sight. Paul, Paul again has these, the, the, these uh, powers, the, these uncanny abilities that are suggested and that fit both within a naturalistic understanding of illness and childhood, but also indicate his, his sort of uncanny is superhuman or extra human uh, abilities, but it's all rendered through Paul's consciousness. And it brings us much closer to him. There's some scenes in Oliver Twist uh, where the child's perspective, uh, particularly the child in isolation, when, when, when a child is alone and uh, it, it's not the child in interaction with other, with other people. Paul. Paul's consciousness is rendered in a way that uh, no writer before Dickens, with the possible exception of Blake and Wordsworth, the romantic poets to whom uh, Dickens owed a great deal. Uh, and I, I see a, the suggestion that Paul is autistic. I mean, that would be another 
sort of modern term to, to use to characterize some of, but uh, Paul doesn't have the, the rigidity of at least my knowledge of autism, uh, I think uh, suggests is typical of those children. He has a, he has a, you know, a power, a, 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 an ability to engage with other people and to inspire their their love and to respond to, to them, uh, particularly to old people and to people on the margin. Right? So, um, but anyway, yes, the child's point of view, the child's perspective brings us inside from Paul, him only from the outside. Peggy? My dog. Um, I've known somebody with teeth like Carker's. <laughs> she was a teacher in a different whole different genre than this. And the, the feeling I got was my heart is not safe in the same room with this woman. <laughs> and my take on Carker is he is jealous of everybody and he'll take it out on everybody and he's running the business. I mean, Dombey doesn't seem to be competent to run a business. And Carker's running it and taking over. And that's what I see with him is he's taking over everything because he's feeling totally furious at everything, but he doesn't show it that way. He's just scary. <laughs> but I don't think that Dombey loved Paul because I don't think Dombey loved anybody. He doesn't even know Paul, he's grieving over the loss of the thing that was the potential for him to be great. And it wasn't Paul, it wasn't who Paul was, but Florence knows who Paul is. So. There's one point where Dombey has a tear in his eye. And um, I think Dombey doesn't know how to love, but he, he wants to, know how to love, but he doesn't know how to go about it. Um, yeah. And that's, there, there's a, a deep sadness about that. Uh, he's grieving. And, he's totally and, grieving. And, and one way to read it is his that he's, he's- son, but he, not over the real son. You could say he's, he's grieving for himself, for his, his loss of the precious object. Um, uh, but, but I think he's, you know, there, 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 there's, a, there's, an, there's an essay, uh, an important critical essay on Dombey and Son that, uh, and it has a wonderful title, it's Firmness and Wetness in Dombey and Son. And it's playing with the, the, uh, the word firm, which is the business of Dombey and Son. And it, but it's also playing with rigidity and firmness and stiff upper lip and don't show your emotions. And, and Mr. Dombey is the epitome of firmness. And mm -hmm. Florence, and her, remember what her nickname is, it's Floy. <laughs> Talk about a fluid name and what the waves were always saying. So they're, they're, you know, it's an oversimplification. It's an oversimplified binary opposition between uh, dryness and wetness or firmness and, and fluidity um, mm -hmm. uh, or between um, rigidity and emotion. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that's an interesting place to begin. What would it take for Mr. Dombey to move out of firmness and into fluidity? <laughs> it would take loving someone, being in a loving relationship. And there's Florence who's available, who's going to his door at night and kissing the door and who's hoping that her father will kiss her uh, when, when she comes into the room and he reaches out his hand, which is a way of holding her at a distance. Um, Florence, Florence is there 
to teach him how to love. Teach all of us how to love. But but Carker is like every the whole thing about Dombey is everybody flatters him. And he thinks he's a great person, except he isn't. And I don't think he's competent about anything. He's easy to manipulate. Yeah. The major totally manipulates him. Carker manipulates him. Carker has stolen all his money. I guess that's the next thing. But, you know, the thing, the idea that Dombey might get this woman and Carker doesn't like that either. Uh, yeah, it's um, at some point in it, I think it's Dombey who says he likes, he admires Henry VIII now. That says a lot. I don't remember that passage, but <laughs> that's right just before the proposal. Uh, the mother asked the Mrs. I always want to call her Scoopum, but I think that is. She said, "How did you feel about Henry the Eighth when they're in the cow in the castle?" Oh yeah, yeah. And I admired him. And don't you think he was wonderful? And then she says. Oh, I love the Middle Ages because of the dungeons and the tortures. <laughs> I mean, you know, where are these people going? Sounds like a porno ad. That's, that's another joke about um, modernity. And uh, there was a kind of cult of the Middle Ages and a romanticized vision of the, the Middle Ages that was current in the 1840s. And uh, in, in that sense, Dickens is very much on the side of, of railroads. Are, are railroads a good thing or a bad thing? But, you know, only up through chapter 31. I don't want to talk about anything beyond that. But, um, you know, what's, what moral value is associated with railroads? Well, they're loud. <clears throat> so, uh, it's a question about modernity and where the novel situates itself in relation to this obvious symbol of, of modernity, of, of, of what for many people is progress and for other people is uh, environmental destruction. And, and uh, um, you know, so we can hold that topic in, in suspension for, for now, but yes. Another question or something from the chat. Is there something in the chat, Courtney, we should attend to? Oh, let's see. Um, I'm unable to scroll up through the chart, chat. I'm not sure where my scroll bar is. So I'm, I'm sorry. I... Okay, then let's, let's, take, let's take a question. Okay, so next question is from Barbara. Barbara, you're muted. Right, I didn't unmute myself. Thank you. Um, one of the things I love about Dickens is the fact that he can have these very strange attributes to some of his characters, and especially the evil ones. And the minute I met Carker, I knew that he was robbing Dombey. And the reason I knew that was because of Uriah Heep. Uh, Carker has the teeth, Uriah Heep has the, you know, the <laughs> Mr. Umble. And um, I just thought, you know, that was a good connection. And, and I just knew that, you know, anybody who has teeth like that has got to be evil. And I knew right away that he was stealing from Dombey. And that's from the moment he appears in the novel. Yep, you're, you're right. And um, I, th I think that Carker is playing a very deep and subtle game and that we still need to explore further what Carker is up to. So he's, he's clearly Carker the manager and there's, you know, that term itself is a play on words because everybody is managing Dombey. Dombey is supposed to be the most powerful, you know, among the most powerful people in, in England at this time. He's a representative of the, uh, of the new powerful commercial uh, middle class. 
Um, and we should pay attention to questions of social class too, by the way. But Dombey is incompetent in business and he's incompetent in human relationships. He's incompetent in love. Um, he's incompetent as a parent. Uh, where does his competence lie? Uh, it's in uh, his vision of himself and in the structures that uphold him, chiefly money and patriarchy. Glenna? Yeah, um, um, I didn't want to leave this. Oh, I didn't want to leave this section without talking about the subject of the death of little Paul, because um, it was at one point very fashionable to make fun of Dickens, you know, and not only Dickens, but Harriet Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin, the death of little Eva, the death of little Nell. And um, as a historian, and one who studied the 19th century, child mortality was this horrible plight. Um, and I, when I lectured about this, I often talked about um, Abraham Lincoln. They lost, they had four sons. One died before the White House. One died in the White House. Only one of the four lived to adulthood. And another famous uh, American Ralph Waldo Emerson lost his son when he was four. And um, I've read that Emerson's dying words were my beautiful boy. And so this was a terrible, terrible thing that people had to deal with. We obviously children still die, but it's so much more rare for most modern middle-class Americans. And I think that in all of literature, I simply don't know of anything having to do with this tragic subject that is so beautifully rendered as the death of Paul. I just think it's astonishing. Yep. And yep. Uh, so I'm curious how other people feel about that. Yeah, I, I, I quite agree. Um, and um, everyone loves Paul. And when, you know, the, the, for me, the even more poignant than the actual moment of death is that goodbye scene at the school when everybody is leaving for, for the vacation. Because that, that for me is, is drenched in the foreknowledge of, of loss. And it's also a party. It's a party where Paul gets to ask Florence to play the piano for him. And because he knows that he, he may not have another chance to, to enable Florence to display her talents before so many people as an expression of love for her and pride in her. I mean, Paul is, is so selfless. He's so, he's so generous toward other people. And well, do you think though that the death of little Paul of Paul is sentimental? Would you use that? Um, pejorative term. I mean, I would not, but I, I'm curious. How you feel. I, 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 I would, um, I would turn the term sentimental around and make it not a pejorative term, but a positive term. That sentiment for Dickens in a, in a tradition that goes back to into the 18th century into. Uh, the tradition of the, the man of feeling, that, that to be a, a man of feeling is to be, uh, as a, to realize one's full potential as a, as a man. And, and little Paul already has that virtue, the, the, the power of feeling, of, of sentiment. Um, and so I would say, yes, it's a sentimental scene, but not in a pejorative sense. I, I, I see that as that Paul embodies all of the positive qualities of sentiment that, uh, that Dickens inherited from an intellectual tradition that goes back a century. Phyllis? Um, hi, um, I, I just, um, 
going back to the Carker uh, thing and I, uh, the, the, the marriage or wedding chapter of chapter 31, you know, begins and ends with dawn and the night uh, fighting over the landscape. Dawn is weeping and that's the dew and um, getting, and then the night comes and fills the church. And, um, and then the, the two, um, uh, the, the beetle and his assistant, Mr. Sounds and Mrs. Miff, uh, come in again to have another wedding. And uh, they quote the wedding service. To, I mean, Dickens quotes the wedding service about this man and this woman, not, not the previous wedding, to have and to hold from this day forward, and so on and so forth. The very words that Mr. Carker rides into town repeating with his mouth stretched to the utmost as he picks his dainty way. Um, and that's the and end that's of the, the chapter. That's the end of, yes. So the I will say no more. I will yeah. say no more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then back to the, the, the railroad. It's interesting because uh, in addition to the gentleman that mentioned about Dickens' houses, um, I also just love his descriptions of urban renewal. Um, you know, and, and so he goes to Stagg's Gardens and you can't find it. Right, the railroad has demolished the Toodles neighborhood and replaced it with the railroad inn, the railroad pub. Yep. I mean, I felt like <laughs> it could have happened, you know, today. It just all everybody taking up the cause of that, and then again back to that that powerful scene with Dombey and the crepe and the hat, where he's talking about that railroad journey, and it is the it's the power of death. The the train is the power of death, and that is both modern. Mm -hmm. And timeless, and mm -hmm. um, and that's I think Dickens I think had he also knew how horrible it was to travel by horse. I mean he has wonderful stagecoach descriptions, but he also has this the the horrible toll roads, the mud, the ruts, the upturned carriages. So I, I think Dickens is kind of right now teetering. Um, he's he's between worlds himself sometimes it seems mm -hmm. like in this, but I don't know. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, my, my sense is that Dickens recognizes both the destructive power and the creative power of, of the railroad. Mm -hmm. um, I do too. Yeah. He's, yeah. It's he's, a, in a, in a sense, he's, he's, he remains morally neutral about it. Mm -hmm. He sees both just like with politics. I mean, he never really, I mean, he wasn't a social reformer. He just pointed out the absurdities of many of the social systems. Um, and uh, and I, I noticed this interest of oh, later on, I won't say anymore. Yeah. Later no. on, later on. Later yep. On. Yeah, yeah. A um, couple more hands. Ted. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the railroad and, and also Dombey, uh, maybe they represent something new uh, and maybe not all good. The, the railroad is replacing, you know, what, what came before and there's a lot of destruction involved in the new railroad. That's pretty straightforward. And then what is Dombey? Well, I, I mean, looking at the full kind of cumbersome title of the book, uh, dealings with the firm of Dombey and Son, wholesale, retail, and for exportation. So very much in the world of uh, e either industry or finance. He, he's a, in, in effect, he's a, he's a captain. I, I don't know if a captain of industry, maybe a captain of finance, but big on you know, buying and selling. And his pretentiousness, it's not just pretense like he's a snob uh, and a jerk. He's pretentious in the sense of the, a neo-aristocrat. Dombey and the Dombey name and the Dombey lineage going through the male line and all that, uh, kerf all that fluff, uh, which was not fluff to them, uh, that, that's ar aristocratic speak. And so Carker, Carker is like one of these Shakespearean characters where we have to figure out, or actually fight it out, which house is going to inherit the English crown? Yes. And yes. what kind of contortions can we make to argue that my part of the family gets the crown? And some of those contortions in Shakespeare were, well, there was this girl of, an, of a, a daughter, I should say, of the king several generations back who be 
became our ancestor, and so we should inherit it. And of course, that goes against the rules. Uh, daughters don't count. It, yes, it has to go yes. through the male line. So, but Carker, uh, amongst other things, is is playing the game that Florence, uh, who is not a legitimate heir to the Dombey crown, um, could you know, with a certain amount of contort uh, intellectual contortions, become the way to uh, to inherit the the, the firm. Uh, so go go via Florence. She's just a daughter, but he, she could be married, and then a son-in-law could become the son, and and so forth. Yes. That, that seems to be one of the games. Well, he he plays a lot of angles, but that's one of his angles. That's one of his angles. Um, uh, Carker, since since we've been Shakespearean at a couple of points, Carker is an Iago figure, out of Othello, um, working behind the scenes. Uh, finding ways to insinuate himself to into the good graces of a more powerful male. Um, that's that's one part of his history. Uh, in terms of social class, we should think a little bit about that. Dombey is Dombey is middle class. Dombey is not an aristocrat, except in um, some perhaps some figurative sense, but. Uh, in terms of the British class system at this time, uh, Dombey is not of uh, noble ancestry. He's from the business world. He's, he's definitely middle class. Carker is from an even lower class. Carker is, Carker is like people have, have mentioned um, Uriah Heep. Uriah Heep is, is, uh, uh, is barely from above the working class. He's from the lower, lower, lower middle class. Uh, Dombey is from the upper middle class, but he's not of the gentry or the aristocracy. One of the reasons that Edith Granger is an attractive uh, uh, potential spouse for Dombey is that she, through her mother is related to the Phoenix family who are aristocrats. So Dombey by marrying Edith is marrying up. And in the scene, the painful but funny scene where the, uh, the what's it called? The opening of the eyes of Mrs. Chick. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I'm gonna read the, the opening of the eyes of Mrs. Chick, chapter 29, Mrs. Chick, uh, in, a, in the cruelest of ways, tells Miss Tox that Dombey is going to be married. And she says that if Dombey had asked her, Mrs. Chick, her opinion about the kind of mate she, uh, he should choose, it would be someone who has connections, uh, 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 blood, station. Um, in other words, everything that Miss Tox does not have. And it's a way of being humiliating to Miss Tox, uh, who believed with good reason that Mrs. Chick was promoting her as a potential uh, mate for, for Dombey. So class is, is an important dimension of, of this novel that we shouldn't forget about. And that's also part of the friendship that exists or that develops between Dombey and Major Bagstock because Major Bagstock as a military man, remember Dombey looks him up in the Gazette to find out you know, what his background is and is impressed by it. And uh, Bagstock moves in a more distinguished social circle than Dombey moves in. Um, and when Dombey goes with Bagstock to Leamington Spa, uh, one of the things that's going on is that uh, uh, Bagstock is Bagstock is is his pander, his his pimp. He's he he knows how to find women, um, and we should really talk about sex in in this novel. This is this is a novel that's that's full of of sex. Edith Edith Granger the, uh, is a beautiful woman who is on the marriage market. She's a widow. Uh, 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 you know, the early conversations that 
Dombey has with Bagstock about her background. She was married before. Um, she had a son and Dombey frowns, but the son drowned. Dombey smiles. Uh, why is that good? It shows A, that she's fertile, um, that B, that she produced a son, which is what Dombey wants more than anything in the world, and C, that the son that she produced is out of the way because he drowned not from any illness, it shows it's not a sign of any constitutional or hereditary weakness, but he died in a physical accident and he's out of the way. So he would not be a rival to the son that Dombey would have with Edith. So he sees her as a good mate. And she, in addition to that, she has beauty. Uh, she has all the talents. You know, he, uh, he, he uh, asks her to, play the piano for him and she does. Uh, he asks if she paints, uh, if she draws and she shows him her pictures. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's as if he's buying a new car and he wants to test drive it. And uh, uh, you know, she passes all of the tests because she has the, the talents of uh, beauty, birth and the social graces that Dombey thinks would improve his position in, in the world, um, the connections to the aristocracy. And he has what uh, Mrs. Granger uh, wants in for her daughter, which is money. So that marriage between aristocracy and, and middle class is something that's going on uh, during this time. And it's a way that the middle class improves its social position and its, its social capital, if you, if you will, uh, in a world where the aristocracy maintains its prestige, but is losing its political and economic power. And so that's part of the negotiation that's, that's going on. Um, but uh, I'm interested in Major Bagstock. We talked a little bit about him before, and I want to propose a, a a way of thinking about Bagstock that begins with his, his name, which, which I think is a direct reference to the male genitals. I mean, bag and stock are testicles and penis. And Bagstock with his huffing and puffing and swelling and uh, his blue color and uh, is a, a mobile phallus. Um, he is the embodiment of sex. He's, he's, he's of, of male desire, of male lust. And uh, he, he, one of the things that he does is to keep repeating his name. I think of this as a, as a form of verbal masturbation. He's, he's always stroking himself in, in public. He carries a walking stick with him that he's always using to poke things with. He beats the, the native who is his attendant, um, uh, male sexuality is also associated with violence. And Dombey is not a sexy man. Dombey has very little sexual power. Um, uh, he's, he's, he doesn't have the kind of uh, charisma uh, of a man who is immediately attractive to, to women. He's, he's too stiff. He, he doesn't know how to flirt. He doesn't know how to make small talk. So he's dependent on Joey Bagstock to be his pimp. And Bagstock knows that that's his job. So he goes out and finds women and talks in vulgar ways to them, flirts with uh, 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 Edith's mother, um, as a, as a way of introducing sexuality into the conversation and gets Dombey uh, excited. Uh, and he praises Edith in ways that uh, make Dombey interested in, uh, in Edith. Um, Dombey needs to be stimulated into action. He doesn't take actions on his own. And, Carker does something similar. Carker, I think, is also uh, in, in less obvious ways than Bagstock. Carker is a 
uh, a sexual creature in this novel. And I think from the very beginning, Carker recognizes that there is a, an adult female sexuality about Edith. And one of the things Carker's plot, Carker's, Carker's goal ultimately, I think, is to supplant Dombey. He wants to become the son. He has been studying uh, Dombey uh, for years. He's moved into the position of running the business. He's taken over, if you will, in everything except ownership from Dombey in the management of business affairs. Um, and and Carker, Carker's initial plot is to uh, uh, find Florence and work his way into Florence's affections by telling, by giving her news about Walter. Um, he rides on his horse. The horse is always a kind of symbol of masculine power and sexuality. Uh, and uh, he rides his horse down to the Skettleses when, when Florence is staying with the Skettles uh, and um, uh, whispers something intimately to her as he's stroking the neck of his, his horse. So his initial plot is that he plans to, to marry uh, Florence and to become the son-in-law and therefore the son and to take over the empty son slot and to eventually to replace Dombey uh, in that, um, that, that sequence, that substitution sequence. But when he meets Edith, he recognizes a different kind of beauty, one that is more explicitly sexual because Edith has been brought up by her, her mother to advertise herself as sexual to men. Um, and so Carker immediately recognizes this. And one of the things that the son can do is to become a rival with the father for the affections of the father's chosen mate. So there's, you know, a there's the the beginnings of a love triangle, a rivalry between Carker and Dombey about Edith. And Dombey doesn't know how to how to make love with with Edith. He he sees her only as an object to be purchased, a, sh a shiny, um, a trophy wife. Um, and he has the, the, the goal of reproducing, of uh, using Edith's fertility, her proven fertility, uh, in order to acquire a son. Uh, so we should keep our eyes on, uh, on, on what happens in, in that regard. Uh, but uh, there are scenes, even in the chapters that we read, where Carker touches Edith. And Carker, when she draws, for example, Carker holds the pencils for her. So when he hands her a pencil to, to draw, um, there's physical contact. At the wedding, Carker buys a bouquet of flowers and gives it to Edith. Um, he is the one who hands her out of the carriage in which she arrives at the, at the wedding. There, there are moments where touch, D Dombey has no ability to touch or to use touch as a way to get close to anyone else. He won't touch Florence. He barely has any physical touching relationship with his son, Paul. Um, but Carker, as part of his feline nature, as part of his animal nature, is a much more sensual creature. And I think that there's a, there's a, a, a sexual charge between Carker and Edith that is hinted at even in the first encounters that they have. And there's a, there's a scene that takes place at Leamington Spa when Dombey, Carker, and Bagstock have dinner together. 
and Dombey sits there silent and Bagstock and Carker carry on the conversation. Dombey doesn't know how to, how to make small talk even with men. And what they talk about is Edith's beauty. So Edith, and they propose a toast. Dombey doesn't propose a toast, but a toast, I think it's Carker who proposes the toast, maybe it's Bagstock. Um, anyway, what's going on here is a, is a, uh, a kind of um, exchange or circulation of, of woman, of, of the, the sexual object among a group of men. They're talking about Edith and Dombey doesn't really participate in that but takes pride of ownership because the woman is his. But the woman is not really his. The woman is, is more Carker's and Bagstock's in this. So, so there's a lot of sex in this novel, but it's subdued. There's not much sex with Florence um, because Florence has not yet bloomed into womanhood, but she's on the way. And a very interesting thing that happens at the end of the wedding chapter or in the wedding chapter is that Mrs. Skewton um, has her eye on Florence and she's thinking of Florence as a substitute. There's a, there's a vacancy when, uh, when Edith marries Dombey, there will be a vacancy in the daughter position. Um, and so, uh, she's scrutinizing Florence with the idea that, yes, okay, here's a pretty young woman soon to be marriageable. I can put her on the marriage market in the way that I did with my daughter. And uh, Edith sees this coming and says, no, I will stand Dombey up at the altar if you insist on, uh, on having Florence come to live with you. She's going to live with me. And so uh, uh, Mrs. Skewton gives in because she wants the marriage more than she wants Florence as another uh, uh, pretty thing to put on the marriage market. So anyway, uh, read for sex, Bagstock, uh, Carker, Edith, uh, it's, it's a, a sexy novel as well as uh, a psychologically profound novel. Uh, so we're almost out of time, um, it's almost four o'clock in California. Thank you so much for joining me. Read on, we will continue talking about Dombey and Son a month from now, um, but I'll sign off for now. So thank you, Courtney. Thank you everybody for hanging in there and um, uh, see you next month.